Hey guys, I'm gonna talk about chapter 29 in this video. So the physical policy, okay. So this is based on your chapter 28, um, big part of it, and also chapter 26. So if you are lost on some of the concept in this chapter, uh, might be a good idea to review the chapter 26 before, okay. So because <laughs> um, it's very foundation um, for this chapter too. So if you if you're lost, let me go back to those chapters. All right. Um, so chapter 29, fiscal policy. Now we talked about this in the previous chapter. So fiscal policy is any time when the government using um, their tools to influence the economic conditions. That's a fiscal policy. But let me show you a better definition than was what I just said. So um, there are two types of policy by the government, um, one called a fiscal policy and one called a monetary policy. So fiscal policy is um, the use of government spending and tax to influence our economy that's called fiscal policy and then for monetary policy this will be covered for the next two chapters um, is whenever the government using the supply of money to influence the economy that's called a monetary policy so first for our fiscal policy here um, there are two type of fiscal policy there's one called expansionary fiscal policy and the other one is called a contractionary fiscal policy. So expansionary fiscal policy, the goal is to stimulate the economy, make, make the economy better. That's called expansionary fiscal policy. And then for contractionary, that means to uh, try to slow it down because we don't want the economy just to go you know, all over the place. We want to slow it down, we're going to use our contractionary fiscal policy. Now, um, let's suppose we have an economy in this scenario. So uh, AD curve shifting to the left, um, which means we're gonna have a recession in the economy. Now, if nothing happens, the economy can self-recover um, because in the long run, you know what, it's better if I show you this um, better than just explaining. So, uh, give me a new page. That's fine. All right, so um, we have a long run aggregate supply curve, a short run aggregate supply curve, and then aggregate demand curve, um, price level, real GDPs. All right, so let's suppose our AD curve is shifting to the left. So something happens, let's suppose our consumption goes down. And then AD curve shift to the left, AD2. We have a new real GDP and then an old real GDP. Now notice how the new real GDP is to the left of our old real GDP. That means this economy is currently in recession. Uh, and then for recession, your unemployment rate is increased so higher unemployment rate now that's the short run solution uh, you're we're not at the long run equilibrium so this is not a stable output for the economy um, that eventually the economy will self-adjust once it self-adjusts something happens so for this for this self-adjustment um, with high unemployment rate so unemployment rate is higher workers will compete when workers compete uh, your wage will go down. Now once wage goes down, um, the cost of company to produce good also goes down, which means company produce more good and they're gonna shift your short run aggregate supply curve to the right. So let's shift our short aggregate supply curve to the right, it's different color. So shifting our short run aggregate supply curve to the right So short run aggregate supply curve two or three. Notice how we're going back to the original intersection here. Then the economy does self recover. Um, so if nothing happens, the economy will, will recover and it will go back to our long run equilibrium. But the problem with this self adjustment is that it takes a long time to self adjust. So imagine this entire process takes two years. 
then somebody will be unemployed for two years, uh, the economy is slowed down for two years. We don't like that, right? So we want this process to be fast, to be faster. And that's why you have this fiscal policy to come in. That with fiscal policy, we can make the process faster and then push the economy back to where it was before. Now remember our AD curve um, has four components. So consumption, investment, government spending, and then net export. So with that going on, um, if you your equity demand or if your government spending is increased, that will increase your equity demand curve, which means AD curve will be shifting to the right. So before the the economy self-adjusts and you're moving your AS curve to the right, we can push the AD curve to the right and then back to where it was before. And that way the economy goes back to the original equilibrium. And that's preventing self-adjustment as a fast recovery. So that will be called expansionary fiscal policy, which means the economy will, will expand the economy, stimulate the economy, and make, make the economy better. Okay, so um, here we go. So expansionary fiscal policy will push the AD curve back to where it was before. So before the economy uh, self-adjusts from point A to point B and then back to point C, we can push the economy back to where it was before, and then you're back to point A now. Okay, so that's that's the idea of the expansionary fiscal policy. Now for contractionary fiscal policy, um, it's, the, it's the reverse. That uh, sometimes the economy need a self-correction, um, but those self-corrections might not be what you desired. So let's suppose we have an economy and that's very hot, okay? So long run, equity supply curve, equity demand curve, and then short run, equity supply curve. So let's suppose something happens and the economy is very, very good, okay? So AD curve shifting to the right. We're at a a higher real GDP, that means unemployment rate is low, so the economy is very good, everybody have a job, um, and if nothing happens. So if unemployment is low, and then companies will now, um, will now compete for workers. So when companies compete, wage will go up. When wage goes up, uh, the company cost goes up, and when cost goes up, your short run equity supply curve will be shifting to the left because it's a higher cost now. So we're gonna shift our equity supply curve to the left um, in the long run, or in the short run, short run supply curve. So this one will be shifting to the right. So you notice that now if nothing happens, we'll go from point A to point B. And then lastly, back to point C. So economy self recovered to where it was before. Um, but what you end up with at point C is that you're gonna have a much higher price level. So for this self-adjustment, you're gonna end up with inflation. So to prevent inflation in the future, what we can do that before the economy self-adjusts, we can push the economy back to where it was before. So this goes back to our four components um, that if you can somehow lower your government spending, this will also lower the equity demand curve and then causing AD curve to be shifting to the left. So that way we're pushing the AD curve back to the original AD curve one and you're going back to point A. You can avoid any type of um, you know long or, or high inflation in the future. Okay, so that's the purpose of a contractionary fiscal policy. So let's continue. All right, so that's what we did uh, in the Great Recession. So back in 2008, our government signed a Stimulus Act of 2008, which injected $168 billion of government funding into the economy. And then this is also a decrease in tax. So every, every family got a tax rebate. Um, so if you remember, if you can ask your parents, you know, 10 years ago, um, depends on uh, the size of the household. So if they're married or single, single person, then they all got a tax rebate from the, from the government. The idea was that we lower taxes or even having tax rebate, we're getting more money into the economy and they'll improve the economy. 
And also in 2009, we had the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, where the government by itself spent $787 billion. Now, there were also, so this government spending goes up, um, will cause an increase in your equity demand curve. And then your so AD curve will be shifting. Um, this just looks so horrible. So AD curve um, will be shifting to the right. Okay, so AD two. Okay. All right. So this shows you our real GDPs and unemployment those years. So um, when the economy was really bad. Uh, so in two thousand eight, which we started with our stimulus act in two thousand eight. So government um, spending went up um, to to um, to try to offset these problems. So 2008 was a bad year, 2009 was a very bad year, and that's why we had those uh, uh, those stimulus act and also recovery fundings for the for the economy. Um, but you know sometimes you the, whenever the economy is in recession, you're gonna have less money for tax. Um, but if you try to increase your spending, so spending try to go up. Um, how do we do that, right? By borrow money. So that's how we finance our uh, our fundings during recessions that we give out more tax rebate, we increase our government spending, but all those money coming from borrow money. And then in 2008, the one year, uh, we borrowed almost $1 trillion. Okay, all right. Um, so this will cause a bigger deficit in the budget. So if you look for um, chapter 20, um, 28, we talk about the deficit funding for the government. Uh, so for all the years we have, there were only three years of surplus and every year was um, every year other than, other than those three years was, was a deficit spending that our total spending by the government was more than the, our total revenue for the government and especially for the recession years so 08 09 2010 the recession years uh, our deficit was very very big because we don't have enough tax revenue so we borrow money and also increase our spending by the government all right so um for contractionary fiscal policy, this is used to slow down the economy. So we can use, we can do the contractionary fiscal policy either by decreased government spending or increase our tax. Now for expansionary it will be reversed. For expansionary is decreased spending or in, or de, sorry. expansionary is increased spending or decreased tax. Contractionary is decreased spending and an increased tax. Okay, so um, this will help uh, us to pay off the money we borrowed during the um, uh, expansionary fiscal policy, not theoretically. So this for US government never happens. Uh, we never pay off our debt, okay? Um, and then another thing we can do with our contractor fiscal policy is to slow down our economy that's overheated. So like we mentioned before, um, that for this economy, that you suppose you go from AD, um, so if you go from 82 to 81, then we have an overheated economy. If nothing happens, you're gonna go from B to A and then A to C. And you end up with very, you end up with very high inflation. Um, however, we can avoid that by pushing the AD curve back to 82, which means by either uh, lower our spending or increase our tax. Either way, it will cause AD curve back to 81. And then you can avoid having high inflation in the future. Now this uh, expansionary contractionary is also called a counter cyclical fiscal policy. So it's what we're, whatever we're trying to do with our fiscal policy is to smooth out our business cycle. Now if you remember what you learned from the previous chapters, um, the business cycle are the four phases in the economy and they're very natural. So you have real GDP and then time over here. And for business cycle, it goes up and down, up and down, up and down, right? So uh, at the top, that's your peak. Um, at the bottom, it's your trough. And then when it's going up, it's expansion. When it's coming down, it's recession. Now, this is very uh, volatile. Uh, we don't like that. So we can use our uh, fiscal policies to smooth them out. So instead of having very violent swing of the economy from left and right, we can smooth everything out. So whenever the economy is very hot, we, we try to cool it down by using contractionary fiscal policy. Whenever the economy is very cold, we're gonna you know push it higher by using expansionary fiscal policy. So this is also called counter cyclical uh, fiscal policies. So against business cycle. 
All right, so now what's a Keynesian theory? So Keynesian theory is the idea of this counter-cyclical fiscal policy that um, our government should spend our uh, government spending and tax to um, to offset um, the economic conditions that's currently in the economy. Um, so if the economy slows down, we, we stimulate it. If the economy gets too hot, we cool it down. All right, so um, remember, no keep memorize this okay so expansionary is increased government spending or lower taxes and a contractionary will be lower government spending or increased taxes and then there's a goal over here so if you guys have time go over this carefully okay um also know that for expansionary fiscal policy it will cause deficit to increase and then for um, contractionary fiscal policy this will cause deficit to decrease all right so also next know what's a multiplier effect so multiplier is that sometimes um, the action of one initial impact can cause multiple actions in the economy. It's like throwing a, a, a rock into the pond of waters. You're gonna have multiple uh, ripples, multiple effect, and that's called a multiplier effect. Um, so to know to know our multiplier effect, uh, you need to know first what's a cause something called a marginal propensity to consume. So this is the proportion of your additional income that is spent on consumption. So the formula is your change in consumption over change in income. Now the triangle is called delta, it stands for change. Okay, so change in consumption over change in income. And then MPS, um, MPS is your marginal propensity to save. So change in saving over change in income. And then your MPS, um, plus MPC is equal to one, okay? So MPC is your change in consumption over change in income. All right. So this number is between zero and one, um, but sometimes it can be more than one. Uh, that's when consumers have borrow money, okay? Um, so suppose your MPC is 0.75, and then government increased the uh, uh, spending by a hundred billion dollars. Um, this will be extra income for the for the workers by hundred billion dollars. But the workers wouldn't wouldn't keep all the money. What they would do, they would spend it. So this hundred billion dollars will have multiple effect in the economy. So let me show you some numbers here. Um, give me Excel spreadsheet. So let's suppose um, for the very first step, our government, oh, let's time in this. So MPC is 0.75. So government inject, so initial impact is gonna be, um, so first wave, so it'll be a hundred billion dollars. Um, now, once our workers had the money, they will spend it back to the economy. Now they wouldn't spend everything. So part of it will be saved, the other part will be spent. So for the second wave, how much money will be um, will be spent in the economy? There will be um, 0.75 times how much this is. So the first wave of 75, um, which will be 75 billion dollars. Now for the third wave, so once the money is spent for the second wave, uh, those would be actual income for the consumers and then they wouldn't just keep it, they would spend it too. So when they're spending those money, this will cause a third wave. Now the third wave wouldn't be the entire $75 billion because part of the money will be saved. Now how much will be saved would be the 0.25 and the, the portion that's spent it will be, will be increasing our real GDP. So we're gonna do the 0.75 again. 0.75 times 75. That's your third wave. Now we can keep doing this. Okay, so uh, let me see. Let me do some changes here. So 0.75 never change. It's always 0.75. So you can drag this down. So you can keep going, 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 going until the number become almost zero. All right. So that's the that's called a multiplier effect. That the change in one initial impact will cause multiple changes in the economy. See, I can still keep going and the number is still there. 
So uh, if you add everything together, that's your total impact. But this total impact is all caused by an initial change of a hundred million dollars or a hundred billion dollars. That is called a multiplier effect. Okay. All right. Um, if you look at on the graph, um, suppose um, this is our first a hundred billion dollars. And that's your second wave, that's your third wave, and fourth wave, and so forth. So this will cause multiple wave of changes in the AD curve. So sometimes if your economy is short by, let's say, $100 billion, you don't need to spend $100 billion to push the economy that far. You can spend something less than that, and then your multiplier will help the economy to reach $100 billion total change in the economy. Now the formula for MPC, uh, for, for formula for the multiplier is this, is one, divided by one minus MPC. Um, so if your MPC is 0.75, so one divided by one minus 0.75, the multiplier is four. That means for every $1 spent by the government, this will cause uh, a $4 change in the economy. That's your multiplier effect, okay? Um, now your fiscal policy is not perfect. So there are three problems for fiscal policy. So first is the timing lag that uh, fiscal policy is slow. Um, some, there's three, la three part of lag over here. So first is recognition lag. That means uh, it takes some time for our government to recognize the problem. Uh, second is implementation, that it takes time for the policy to pass through Congress. Uh, third is impact act. So this it also takes some time to actually to have an impact on the economy once the law is passed. So all three lag here will slow down the, the delivery of your fiscal policy. And then sometimes uh, with, a, with a lag in here can cause the economy uh, even worse, then it can have the, uh, the negative impact on the economy. So let's suppose our economy is following this business cycle, okay? So going up and down, up and down. Now let's suppose right now we're at this portion economy. So economy slows down. And then our government says, oh, you know, that's not good, that's recession. Let's use our expansionary fiscal policy. Now, however, because of three lag, uh, the time is slowed. So imagine that uh, by the time our government is actually using this policy, the economy already self-recovered, the economy end up over here. And then you're using your expansionary policy that will make the economy even harder, right? So increase government spending or lower taxes, um, the economy is spending even more money. We're pushing economy to somewhere that it should never be at. Okay, so the economy is way too hot. So that's why that this three lag in here uh, will sometimes make, will make the economy much worse. Okay. Um, also know as an automatic stabilizer uh, that there are um, there are components built into the economy that will automatically stabilize the economy. Um, so, so this four over here is the first two. Um, this will be on the um, contractionary side. So one is called a progressive income tax system. So we learned this in last chapter. So if our income is too high, then our uh, taxpayers will pay a higher income tax. Uh, that will cause the economy to slow down by itself. Uh, for corporate profit tax, same thing. So if economy economy getting too hot, company will pay a higher corporate tax, and that will slow down the economy as well. And then these two on the bottom here, um, that is your expansionary stabilizers. So unemployment benefit. So when the economy slows down, they automatically people getting laid off from work, but automatically they're getting money from the unemployment benefit, right? So there's some money for them when they when they're when they're unemployed. We also have welfare programs, which means that if your if your income is low enough, you can receive benefit from the government. So that's also automatically okay. So they will help out the economy, uh, more like expansion, expansion policies. All right, so next note is crowding out. So crowding out just means when the, con when the government is too big, they will push some consumers out of the market. Um, let me give you an example. Uh, let's suppose you want to buy the new iPhone. The new iPhone is not cheap. I think the price for it is what, like $1,200. But imagine that our government also want to buy the iPhone. Now demand for iPhone goes higher, price goes higher. So imagine the price is not 1200 anymore and the price for the new iPhone will be 1500. Well, you know what, that's too high. I wouldn't buy anymore. So if that's the case, you are being crowding out of the market 
because government spend too much money, and that's called a that's called a crowding out effect. Um, now it's not so much as in turn of the uh, iPhone we purchase, uh, but this has to do with the the money our government borrow, because every time there's a recession, government always borrow more money. Now when they borrow more money, um, they will push the interest rate higher. Um, when the interest rates push higher, our consumers borrow less money, so they've been crowded out of the economy. Uh, that's called a crowding out effect. Okay. All right, so we talk about this. Um, so saving, um, this one is not so obvious than the previous two. Uh, it's, it's not so much um, commented by the economist, um, but it's there that sometimes our consumers would change our saving behavior based on the fiscal policy of the government. Now again, this is this just is a theory out there, but it's not that um, not that evident. So the theory says that suppose I'm a consumer and I notice the government policy right now is using the um, expansionary fiscal policy. So they are borrowing money. Now when they borrow money, eventually those money need to be paid back. So which means my future taxes might be higher. So what do I do? I will save more money now when the economy is bad because my future taxes is higher. I can use my um, use my saving to pay off my future taxes. Okay, and this one might have a might have a negative impact on your government spending or tax policies. But again, this this saving shift it's just a theory. Is uh, most consumers do not behave like, like such. All right, um, and then next, know what's the supply side economics. Uh, you guys probably hear this all the time. So sometimes our government, um, instead of um, focusing on the aggregate-demand curve, we can focus more on the supply side economy, So which is the long-run aggregate supply curve. If this is shifted, if this is changed, we can also help the economy out of our recession or expansion, um, most likely recessions. But uh, one problem with the supply side economics is that uh, this policy would take time. So because we try to sh we try to change our resource, technology, and institutions, this takes time to change. So even though this theoretically will work, but it's just very slow to input, input it. Okay, and then for most economies, um, this, this is the long term change they have in the economy, not a short term policy. Um, so if your AD curve, I mean, if your long range supply curve shifting to the right, you your output is increased, and this can help the economy recover from recessions. Now, for supply side economics, um, there are different policies we can look at it. So first, you can have maybe uh, research and development tax credit, so giving company discount when they do research and development. Um, we do have this. Um, that's why in the early years, um, companies such as Google, uh, Microsoft. They all had R and D tax credit, so because they were doing research and development, they can pay a lower income tax. Um, and then there's also education policies that we can use our subsidies uh, or tax breaks or even uh, financial aid, try to increase um, the education in the economy, so make all the workers more productive. We can also use lower corporate profit tax, um, so keep let the company keep more profit for themselves. Uh, this is used more often than everything else. Um, last one is that we can, we can try to lower our marginal income tax rate. So make the consumers pay less income tax and therefore keep more money for ourselves. Okay, so all this will have impact on the supply side. That's why they're called supply economics or supply side economics. All right, um, now for one thing for marginal tax rate, they're gonna think about is that um, from you, there's a balance you must play. Uh, that if you try to charge a tax too high, nobody wants to work anymore. But if you try to charge a tax too low, then nobody giving money to government anymore, right? So there gotta be a balance here. Um, so let me give you an example. Let's suppose uh, we have a current tax rate of um, 50%, okay? So whatever, whatever money you mix, you pay a 50% tax. And let's suppose right now in the economy there are only two people, so person A and person B. So person A, uh, let's look at their income. So person A for the entire year works a, uh, makes $100,000. Person B uh, doesn't work at all for the entire year. And then let's see how much tax they pay. So person A will pay half the income to tax, so person A will pay the $50,000 of tax, and then person B paid the zero tax, 
but um, person B is getting a benefit from government. So this tax paid by person A, we're going to give it to person B. That's the benefit from government. So their after tax income, so after tax After tax, person A will have $50,000. Person B have $50,000. Well, if you're person A, would you work again next year? Probably not, right? Because what is the point? You work, you make $50,000. You don't work, you make $50,000. So there's no incentive to work. So if your tax too high, people don't want, don't want to work anymore. But if your tax too low, so imagine our government says, going to charge a 0% um, tax rate. Well, that's a problem because with 0% tax rate, we have no money from tax revenue. And then how do we spend on the social programs in the economy? So um, let's go back to this. So there's got to be a balance here. So how, uh, if you charge, um, if your tax rate is high, um, people don't work anymore, and then your revenue might go down. But if your um, tax rate too low, then we don't, we don't have enough money for the economy, and then revenue still goes down. So um, there is a curve. It's called Laffer curve. So Laffer curve says um, that between our tax revenue, so how much money the government collects, and then the tax rate, um, it's, a, it's like a little curve, concave downshift, um, that, that there is an optimum level right here, the optimum tax amount. Then when, when charged that much, we can maximize our tax revenue by the government. Um, however, this um, can be used to argue for either higher taxes or lower taxes. So Laffer curve was made, was made um, popular by President Reagan back in 1980s. So President Reagan says uh, that our tax in 1980s was way too high, which would lower a little bit. Then Reagan says that our tax in 1980s was on this portion of the um, Laffer curve, that our public is being overtaxed. So if we lower our tax rate a little bit, so lower tax rate, we can, e we can increase our tax revenue. So everybody is better off. Government get more money, consumer keep more money for themselves, and then our tax revenue is increased. Um, now, however, um, it, it didn't work because um, our economy wasn't on this portion of the Laffer curve. The economy was on this portion of the Laffer curve. So when we lower our tax revenue, uh, lower our tax rate, our tax revenue actually went down. Okay. All right. So um, now again, we're going to skip this very political. You guys can read this on your own. Um, it's not that you probably won't see this on the test. Um, so I'll talk about this too. All right, so guys, that's it for this chapter. Um, have any question, let me know, and uh, I'm always here to help you, okay? All right, guys, see you later. Bye-bye.